did one for them when we were down there. Mark, I'm from London, England. Okay. And Paul, I'm from London, England as well. One, two. Once again. What do you want me as well? I'm all right. One, two. Testing. So do you just work this area? Yeah, we were in Florida, the southeast. There's so many recording studios down here that we really never have to leave this area. There's someone always either coming through on tour or coming down to live and record. Sure, sure. So we get a lot of stories out of the criteria. So how bad is the violence around here? Because, I mean, when I was like, up in London, like this cop, he was telling me down here is the worst place in the whole of the States. That's what the image would lead everybody to believe. Uh, I don't know. I mean, but it's lies, is it? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's nice down here. I don't yeah, it's like any place. It depends on where you go. Yeah. And what you, you know, look there's, like. There's places yeah. in London that are just terrific, oh, and yeah. there's places that you just don't hang out at. That's right. Yeah, I mean, it's not That's really right. I live at one of them. It's <laughs> chaotic. I mean, I just read a story in the paper in San Francisco. A street preacher was, was preaching, and someone, a bunch of teenagers taunted him, so he jumped in a Mustang, a 65 Mustang, and ran right into a crowd on the street and killed, I mean, total chaos, you know, people, they jumped on this guy and beat him senseless. But anyway, let's not talk about <laughs> violence. <laughs> talk, talk, explain tonight. Tell me, uh, give me a little detail on how you hooked up with Elvis Costello. Well, a couple of months ago, I came over to New York with Keith, our manager. We spent about three days in New York and three days over in the West Coast, which was primarily just to meet record company people. At the same time, when we're in New York, we're visiting agencies about sort of possibilities of what tours to do, you know. Elvis was one of the ones suggested, and I mean, the reason that we thought it'd be a good idea to do the tour with him is just basically, I mean, he is a songwriter and he's going to appeal to a listening audience, you know, and we wanted to play to an audience who are actually prepared to listen. As opposed to a, an ACDC crowd. Or sure, who wanted to bang their heads, you know. <laughs> I mean, you know, I've got nothing against it, but, you know. What, what can you tell me about, uh, Paul, have you met Elvis personally? Or? Well, yeah, well, we, yeah, we've met him, but, I mean, it's just one of those things where you keep your distance from people. Yeah, you? we've met him, but we'd never admit that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things. What makes him, do you think, so unaccessible to even the people that tour with him? you think that uh, that wouldn't be the case. He'd be a little more open to talk music with his peers, you know. Are we talking about Elvis? Well, well I want to talk about you too, but I want to sure. first kill him. I can't <laughs> say that. <laughs> I mean, nothing, nothing special that uh, makes him uh, hard to work with. I mean, you, as a tour, no. you know, like the fans, for example, think that when bands tour together, you know, they're partying together and they're hanging out together. That's not the case all the time, is it? No, well, obviously not. I mean, just through a time schedule point of view, I mean, as we're sort of heading out the gig, he's heading into the gig, stuff like that. I mean, I mean, he's got the same attitude as we have. We just get on with the job, you know. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, we think it's a bit silly just all mixing in and having a... I mean, we're here for a purpose, yeah. after all, you know. I mean, we're here to break the states. I mean, he's here to this whatever. This is your first tour of the states. That's right, yeah. Tell me uh, how it's been going and describe, uh, if you can, briefly your, your activities over the last six months. Well, I mean, in, in terms of a, an actual tour, it's been quite an easy one because we've been having sort of one day off out of every four, so it's been pretty easy going. This, this thing with Elvis, we actually picked up his tour halfway through, so we're just essentially doing the East Coast. We've got about another four more gigs to do with him, which ends on the 6th of September. Then we're going up to New York to do club dates and out to the West Coast to do some of the clubs out there. A lot of your work uh, is very accessible to clubs. Around sure, well you see that, that whole club scene, is really important in England as much as it is over here. And I mean, that's true of like the advent of video as well. I mean, in, in England, the use of videos in clubs has really been coming on strong recently. I mean, even to the extent where in England now, they've actually started putting video jukeboxes into pubs. 
so that like you know I mean for your equivalent of like say about half a dollar rather than just having the record come up on the machine you can actually sit and watch whatever video you want in when a lot of ways in England video has come more important which isn't a good thing really but there's a lot of bands that are in the charts in England at the moment who just do videos and just do the records and never play live at all. Why do you think it's not a good thing from your point of view? I think a band should play live, you know, I think they owe it to the people. How, how, do you, how does Talk Talk approach a club? Do you do half video, half live, or how do you mix that up? Or you, do you just... We, we see the way videos work in Britain is only as a lot of promotional thing. I mean, you'd never use them to actually substitute for a live performance. It's like this whole thing with sort of like synthesizer work and everything like that in general, which has become an increasingly strong trend in Britain, is there are like a couple of drawbacks to it, which are, it's, it's like they, they can tend to be a reliance on sort of using tapes, using drum machines and things, so that with sort of certain groups, they're not actually capable of delivering live what they can deliver on record. So from that point of view, it is a bad thing, you know. It's, it's sort of almost going to that sort of setup of it being like studio bands rather than performing bands. Yeah, there's a few bands in England that are actually lip syncing live. They're not yeah. actually doing anything. They're just making nice videos. I mean, we're really into videos and we do them and we do them to the best of our ability. How many have you done? We've done three. three. Yeah. Well, we did. We did two videos with, for Talk Talk. We did one with Russell Mulcahy, which was to sort of use the thing of using extras, stuff like that. I mean, we actually made that video first for Talk Talk, which is the one you're showing. What actually happened was, in England, they actually... There were a lot of shows which refused to play it because of sort of like... You know, the fact that we had people in it sort of without mouths and we had people in there with dark glasses who were like maybe blind people and things, it was sort of considered to be possibly in bad taste. So what we actually had to do with Talk Talk was to do an alternative video which would, you know, get shown on certain shows. I mean, we've actually now got a new single out in England and we've just done a video for that with another director again. What we've actually done with that is, we've, rather than it being a thing where the band is the central subject of the video, we've got an eight-year-old kid who is sort of like the star of the video, you know, in the same way like with our first Talk Talk one, the monkey's the obvious star. You know what I mean? You're seen in the video, but not that much? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in sort of fantasy sequences that this kid has. Sort of like, you know, E.T. It's like, you know, the British version of E.T. <laughs> so you like the idea of the different ways video can be done instead of a band up there playing their instruments? Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's really important. I, I always like in videos, if, if the band are actually in it, to see them doing it rather than sort of faking it, you know, doing it as though it is for real. At the same time, it's, it's like with anything, if, if you want it to get repeat, repeatedly played, it must have things in it aside from just specifically the band performing. That's what we spoke about earlier. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. The club dates that you've got scheduled in the States, will they include your promotional video clips? In other words, will you maybe show those while you're backstage and then come out on stage and and do it live, or do you think they won't even be shown that night? I would think they wouldn't be shown yeah. that night. I, don't, I mean, we I don't, don't like to cross the two. I mean, a video should be a video, and a performance should be a performance. And at the moment, we don't think we're at the stage where we... If you integrate the two, it's got to be done properly, and we don't think we're at that stage yet. There are some bands that have managed to combine the live medium and the video. Oh, you know, sure, it's sure. It's, it's quite successful. It's like a, a, a band warm-up instead of having having an opening band or something show your videos prior to your coming on stage, it gets them all excited about actually... Sure, singing. you see, the only problem with us doing that with Talk Talk is they're going to want to know where the monkey is, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you have to bring them on the road, but yeah. yeah. It's like Devo with the Boogie Boy, Boogie Boy. <laughs> those characters. Tell me how you... Mark, you've, you've been around the music business for a while. I know your brother, Ed Hollis, was uh, involved with uh, Eddie and the... the That's Hot right, Hollis yeah, Party. sure. And uh, how did that... Uh, how, how do you see your involvement in that. Are you anxious to get started on your own career? Well, uh, it's, it's like with anything. I mean, with any sort of big brother, you always sort of look towards what they're doing. It, it certainly sort of made the whole music business that much more apparent to me than otherwise it wouldn't have done. At the same time, you know, right from sort of when I was like, say, 12 and that, it was making me up tapes of music that otherwise I would never have even got to hear. 
I mean, in terms of the actual formation of this band, it was important because it actually started around me going in to do some publishing, like a sort of publishing contract, right? Just purely for songwriting. At the same point, my brother Ed was working in another studio, and Liam Polo of the rhythm section were actually working on that session, and he suggested to them maybe they'd come up and sort of try working with me. And it was just something that was really happening, you know, so we just sort of took it from there. So the idea of actually forming a band to perform your music was the best way to go rather than just publish it and let other artists do it? Yeah, I mean, ob obviously, I always would rather have played it than just sort of write it for someone else to do because the actual performance of it is one of the most important things about sort of doing music. It, it was just like sort of good fortune, the way it all sort of fell into place. I mean, right right down to, it, it was like we had one week in the studio to go in to do some demos for the publishing deal. Within that first week, it was obvious things were happening really sort of strongly. So we did the publishing deal. We used the money from that publishing deal to sort of finance us in rehearsal for a six month period. After like five months of being in rehearsal, we got hold of Jimmy Miller, you know, who sort of produced things like Jumping Jack Flash, Spencer Davis, Traffic, stuff like that. And he came in and did some demos with us. We put those out to the record companies. We then did five like London nightclub dates. After the third one of those, we got a session on like Radio One, which is the major radio network in England. And off of that, like, the deals really started coming in. It's, it has been very fast. I mean, I think we've been really lucky, fortunate in the timing. The demo 